Today we're going to take the 1170 at four run and see how it stacks up. Why we think it's going to redefine the 40 foot market, especially for the short handed sailor. Seawind 1170 is the second of a brand new generation of design from Seawind, with more angular lines, raked bows, flat decks, and a whole lot more buoyancy and volume. The design borrows its good looks from the wildly successful 45 foot Seawind 1370 that is now in full production in Vietnam. The 1170, however, also heralds a new strategic move from the Australian owned boat builder, with a new purpose built factory in Turkey launching boats into the Aegean Sea for those inspired to explore the Turkish coasts, Greek islands and beyond into the Mediterranean. This facility has quickly been filled with production and an expert team of boat builders recruited from neighbouring boat building yards in the super yacht industry. But we are lucky enough today to be sailing on hull number two that has recently been shipped to Australia. And today we're heading out on Sydney Harbour. In test its sailing ability, I'll be sailing shorthanded. Motoring out from the dock, it has a similar feel with twin helms, lots of visibility through the toughened glass windows, and winches and rope clutches within reach. This is what you'd expect on a sea wind. What is noticeable, however, is just how much more headroom there is through the cockpit. And you have much broader sun and weather protection, not only over the helms, but the entire cockpit itself. The helm features double seats with backrests that fold to allow forward seating or a backward seating position for socialising. They also have excellent storage for gas and rope bin lockers on the starboard side and a well insulated ice chest or drinks fridge with a refrigeration unit under the port helm. The boat motors comfortably about six knots at 2300 revs, which is about your cruising speed on the 29 horsepower Yanmar diesels with sail drives and have three bladed gory folding propellers. The helm now has electric windows which stow easily at the push of a button and this gives you access to the BNG chart plotter. We bring the boat up into the wind and raise the mainsail on the electric Lumar winch. A two-speed Harkin winch would be nice here as you can raise it a bit faster, but they are more pricey. Once the main is set, we stow the main halyard into this really nice rope bin that takes all the lines easily. We turn the boat away from the breeze a little and pull out the self-tacking jib, which is in the furled position. We duck over to the starboard helm to do this, which has a manual winch. If you don't want the exercise, a second electric winch here would be a nice addition. Now we power up both sails and we drop the bow down to increase the speed. The sails are a tri-radial cruise laminate sail from Doyle, which is the builder's preferred sail lot. They're a nice set of sails and worthy upgrade from the standard Dacron sails that can stretch a bit after a while. The mainsail is 57 square metres, while the self-taking jib is 27.5 square metres. The rig is a whopping 18.8 metres off the water, which is pretty impressive for this boat. It certainly gives the boat plenty of power. Our boat spin impeller wasn't working today, but we're sailing about 15 knots of true breeze, gusting to 18, which could convert to about 24 knots apparent as we point. At 38 degrees to the wind, we're getting 8 to 8.4 knots of boat speed, or just shy of 8 knots if we pinch up to 35 degrees, which is pretty impressive. Tacking is super easy thanks to the self-tacking jib and tacks through about 90 degrees and it's quite effortless. The hull shape on the 1170 is close to the 1370 hull, both being a more modern hull shape with an almost arrow hull shape with a fine entry point at the raked bows, yet plenty of reserve buoyancy in not only the freeboard but also in the increasing double chine effect which we'll talk about a bit later. The stern has less rocker a more rectangular shape to provide buoyancy as the boat powers up off the breeze. So you do hear a little more wash, but you know you're going fast. There are mini keels that are designed to beach the boat and take the load of the boat. As we move onto a beam reach, we drop the traveller down the main sheet through this endless side loading winch. The jib also has a traveller control to open up the slot and use the full width of the self-tacking track. This is all done from the helm. Here we're doing about eight and a half knots at about 90 degrees. So now's a good time to try one of our extra sails. We're going to use the Code Zero, also known as a furling screecher. The screecher has a two to one halyard, so you can put some tension through the luff and it helps it furl easier. The Harkin Endless Furler has a neat quick release pin to attach the sail onto or off the Longeron beam. And that allows you to leave the furler and line set up. So we drop a little bit further off the breeze, release the furler and sheet on. Then we furl in the jib. 
It's a super fun sail to use, and it's about 51 square metres, which is just a bit smaller than the main sail. So it powers up quite nicely. And now we're doing over nine knots, and the apparent wind has moved forward to about 75 degrees. And this is where the boat really powers up, so we're flying nicely. The beauty of this sail is you can furl it back up once you're finished and leave it furled while you're on the boat. I should also add, this is surprisingly easy to handle, to furl in or to sheep. Now it's time for the main event, running the spinnaker. The kite is an asymmetrical kite, which runs from this removable carbon bowsprit. It's removable to reduce the overall length from about 41 feet down to 39 feet to help reduce marina fees. The kite is in a sock and allows you to set it up and drop with minimal fuss. We run a bit deeper the kite and we're sitting at over 11 to 11 and a half knots of boat speed, but the apparent has shifted about 90 degrees. Pulling up to anchor, we use the electric counter to measure out how much road from the helm. The locker for the fenders are quite deep on this boat, and the sail locker for the extra sails is voluminous. Inside the sail locker, you can see one of the two water tanks that total up to 500 litres. But if you had a water maker, you might even forego the secondary tank and reduce it down to 300 litres and give you even more storage. There is a well thought through rainwater capture into the primary tank from the hardtop. This does give you the opportunity to quarantine this water in case there is some sort of contamination, then release into the secondary tank. I thought I should also point out there's a really nice new non-skid pattern that is a little bit more comfortable to walk on, and we've seen this on the Corsair trimarans as well. Plus there are flush mounted hatches that are out of sight and you don't kick your toe on them. There is a very slick one-piece hardtop that has flush mounted solar panels that you can't even see from the deck level. This is very clean and still includes 960 watts of solar panels with two MPPT regulators. Now let's take a look inside and wow, doesn't this boat have plenty to offer? Seawind's famous tri-folding door opens the boat right up and in the stern you have a nice bench seat. And there is now an optional cockpit table. Inside the saloon, the boat just feels big thanks to increased headroom and windows that are more upright. Now I'm six foot three and there's heaps of room above my head both in the cockpit and in the saloon, up to about six foot nine inches. We have a very generous saloon lounge with a drop down table that offers an additional large bed, plus a single day bed and a roving ottoman that we've seen on the Seawind 1260s as a single day bed. The nav station is big, and probably a little bit more space for displays and switch panels than previously. And the forward opening windows are unbeatable and have been redesigned to allow greater airflow and now more robust struts. There's a 32 inch TV and surround sound stereo. Looking down at the galley and it is very open and spacious. And seriously, you'd have to be on a 45 footer before you get this sort of galley space. The increased hull beam also helps thanks to the double chine at the waterline. So there's more space above the waterline and yet keeping the hull quite efficient. It feels like there's almost an extra foot of space in the beam of each hull on this boat. And the headroom is plentiful as it is through to the forward cabins. This is a great addition to the model and brings with it more headroom above the beds as well. So you can now sit up and read a book quite comfortably. The starboard side enjoys a large queen bed with ensuite forward and larger than previous double aft cabin, both in width and also height. The port side enjoys a large island queen bed with bedside tables. Deep hanging locker forward with shelves and other storage nooks. Again, you really feel the volume thanks to the flat decks, and the windows are also quite large, provide a nice view. Midships, and we have a large storage locker, and with all the electronics and the inverter and chargers stored in the lower section. Aft in the spacious separate shower and electric toilet with bidet sprayer, and a sleek glass door makes a very nice bathroom. Behind the shower, you have direct access to the 29 horsepower Yanmar diesel motors and sail drives. These are located in the reverse position to conserve space. In summary, the Seawind 1170 takes the 40 foot range into a whole new dimension. You get an incredible combination of compromise between a touch of luxury, yet with very practical and spacious ergonomics. A touch of performance without being too technical. And what feels like a big boat without being too overwhelming. This boat will suit those wanting to live aboard and go cruising around Australia or the Med and beyond suit the short-handed sailor, a couple, or even a single. If you'd like an information pack on the Seawind 1170, click here. To watch more videos on the Seawind range, click here.